Now let's move on to the next paper, which is an extension of Transformer Excel, and that's called ExcelNet. I like this paper because it's going to help you merge two ideas, the ideas of GPT and the decoder part of your transformer and the ideas of uh, BERT and the decoder part of the transformer. This is beautiful. There is a quote, I guess, from a famous person that intelligence is about discovering the similarity between different things and understanding the difference between similar things. So one of them is about the big picture. One of them is about the detail. The question is, you, yes, you gave us two language models. One was autoencoding, denoising. The other one was autoregressive. We know the difference between the two. They are different. One is predicting the next word. The other one is just denoising and predicting the masked words. We understand the difference, but are they related somehow? And what are the shortcomings of these two? Let's see. Again, you have your corpus. For AR model, given the context, you are predicting the next word. This is forward. You can have the backward version. Given the future, predict today. So both of them are fine. And these are valid ways of expanding this probability using the chain rule. For the masked language model, the autoencoding one, we mask a, buck, a couple of words, and then we are going to predict those words. So what are the shortcomings of these two methods? For AR model, I mean, there is nothing special about the forward product or the backward product. Any possible permutation can work to factorize this probability. So there is nothing special about this going forward or backward. What is the problem with autoencoding methods, BERT, is that uh, there is a discrepancy when you do pre-training and when you do fine-tuning. During pre-training, you have this mask token, and this token, you're not going to see it during fine-tuning. So there is a bias towards this mask in your data, which doesn't exist when you go to fine-tuning. So both of them have problem, have problems. But how are they related? Let's expand this term a little bit. Let's parameterize it. The problem now you take a log of the product is going to give you the summation of the logs. And let's say you are doing the forward product. And that one we were modeling with a decoder, with a decoder part of a transformer. So this is just a decoder part of a transformer. And then you had a softmax. And these are your word embeddings at the target. That's how you model this probability. For autoencoding, what do you do? You take your sentence, you corrupt it, you mask 50% of your words, and then you need to predict the masked tokens. Mathematically, it's kind of how it's going to look like. You have the maximum of the log of the probability of the masked token conditioned on the corrupted token or the corrupted sentence. You can expand it. Again, the product of the log is the log of the product. You can expand it like this. And now you are making an assumption that these probabilities, given the mask, are independent. So you are making a strong assumption here. Otherwise, you need it to condition on the rest of this stuff. So that's another shortcoming of AR autoencoding models. You are making a strong assumption that if I know the corrupted sentence, while predicting each of these words, you are predicting, I don't know, 50% of your words. Those words that you're predicting are going to end up being independent. And there is no guarantee that that's a correct assumption. And what is this M? This M is going to be one if XT is maxed, is masked. Otherwise, it is zero. So only for the masked tokens, you have this last function. Okay, that's one change. And the other change is how you model this probability. So you model this probability by taking the encoder part of the transformer into account. This is the encoder part. A sentence goes in, a sentence comes out, and then you're going to read the teeth word in your sentence that was outputted from the encoder part of a transformer. OK, that's the decoder. This is the encoder. There is a strong assumption here, the independence assumption. Given the corruption, your words that, are out, that you're outputting are independent. There is this bias towards the token mask which is not going to exist when you do your fine tuning. And there is this idea of AR and using the decoder part. And we saw that there is nothing special about going forward or backward. Any permutation is going to work. So maybe this is the key observation 
connecting the two, any permutation is going to work. So let's try that. Let's create a permutation of these numbers, one up until capital T. So ZT is the set of all of the permutations. What does it mean? Any member of this ZT is an index, okay? Is the teeth element of that perturbation. So maybe your perturbation is three, one, two, four. So Z2 is now one because it was three, one, two, four. And what is Z of every term less than T? This is all of the first elements, the first T minus one elements in your permutation. So you're just permuting these numbers. So how about trying this out as your loss function? Two permutations, one is the forward product, one gives you the forward product, one gives you the backward product, and the other elements of these permutations, set of permutations, is going to give you different reordering of your words and different ways of expanding that product using the chain rule. Is everything clear so far? Yes. Okay, so what are we going to do? So you're, you have an expectation over the permutations. So you can have a summation over all of your permutations if you want to do it in a Monte Carlo fashion. But there is a catch. Here in this forward model or backward model, when you are predicting word T, you know the index. You are sitting at location T and you are predicting the word T. But once you do your permutation, you are going to lose the position. You're not going to know what is ZT. You're going to know what is XZT, but you're not going to know what is ZT. Again, this is one of those cases that you have a brilliant idea. You take it to your computer and it's not going to work. And the detail is that you're forgetting ZT. At what location are you predicting the word? So the solution for that is uh, you sit on location ZT, the same way that you were sitting at location T. So you're going to sit at location ZT. And let's forget about uh, this masked to a stream attention for now. And let's focus on this example. Let's say this is your permutation, three, two, four, one. While predicting word three, you are paying attention to word three. While predicting word two, you are allowed to pay attention to word two and word three. So we are now at location two. You're allowed to look at these two locations. While predicting word four, you can look at word four, two, and three. So it's going to be here. It's going to be four, two, and three. While predicting word one, you can pay attention to everybody, including yourself. So when you are implementing this, you don't change the order. You're always going to predict x1, x2, x3, and x4. But what you're going to play around with are these masking. So you play around with your masking. You don't play around with the order. You're always predicting x1, x2, x3, and x4. And this way, you're never going to forget zt, the location, because you are sitting at this location and then predicting that. So this problem we solved. We brought back zt. But there is another catch. While predicting word at location zt, you can pay attention to the location, but you are not allowed to pay attention to the word or to the word vector. While predicting x1, you're allowed to pay attention to position one, but you're not allowed to pay attention to the vector for x1. Why? Because if you do that, you're cheating. You already know the answer. The answer is x1, and you're paying attention to x1. So you know the answer. That's why you need two heads or two streams of attention. Mathematically, they are going to look like this. You can have a query stream, which is using the location but is not seeing the location, the value, or the word vector for x, z, t. And then you have a content stream, which is paying attention to both. I'm going to tell you why you need a context stream. But for now, mathematically, that's the formulation. Visually speaking, uh, for the context stream, your query is coming from here. The key and the value, they can come from the future vectors and this vector here and itself. The, that was the content stream, the query stream, you're missing that connection, okay? So you have a dedicated path, the query path, which is not paying attention to the word, to the current word, but it's paying attention to the location. And then you have a content path that is paying attention to the content, the current content. Why do you need to do this? Because for uh, 
transformers, you are processing your sentence in parallel. So that's the key point. You are not doing it one word at a time. You are processing the entire sentence at once. If you are processing the entire, at, the entire sentence at once, while predicting the words that are coming out of after time t, you are going to need x, z, t. But while predicting the current word, you only need the location. You shouldn't condition on x, z, t. So basically, the content, the content stream, you need it because the sentence is being processed in parallel, the entire sentence. And the words that are coming after x, z, t, you need to know what is x, z, t. That's why you're going to have the content stream. This is just what I explained. And then you're going to have a dedicated mask for your query stream where you get rid of the diagonal. You're not allowed to pay attention to the content. And that's going to, and the way, the way that you're going to predict, you're going to use the query, the output of the query stream to do your predictions. The idea is that you need H2 because you need to predict X3. You need H2 because you need to predict X4, etc. So this is one of those cases that an idea looks beautiful mathematically, but when you code it up, you are in trouble. You need to go into a lot of details. So is everything clear? Do these attention masks get uh, randomly sampled then? Exactly. So this sampling here that you're seeing, the Monte Carlo sampling, and these permutations, this is how you're going to implement them. So, so you just implement the mask. The mask is really the only thing that accounts for the, the permutations. Everything else kind of just flows through matrix multiplication all at once. And you exactly. Change the exactly. That's a smart. Okay. And That's you, the only thing that you change. And are you just sampling from all possible permutations? You're not actually like running through because that would be potentially... So you sample a permutation, like what you did here, you sample a permutation, but then based on that permutation, you're going to create your masks. But in the end, we're not, we're not going to look at all possible permutations. You're going to look at all possible permutations according to this formula. But your question is very relevant to, the, to what I'm going to explain next. Okay. What you're now telling me is that this is really costly. You sample... Uh, an order, a permutation, you create your mask, you push it through your network, that's fine. And then you do an addition over all of these probabilities. So it's crazy costly, unlike what you had for forward or backward models. Can you reduce the cost? The answer is you keep the permutations, but then you only predict uh, a portion of your sentence. And this constant C, you're choosing it according to the sentence length. Maybe some of your sentences are shorter and you always want to predict 20% of it, 20% of your sentence, okay? Why is it useful? Because now you can get rid of this summation and make it much smaller. So only predict the words in the permutation uh, that are happening after index C. And C is chosen such that you're always predicting 20% of your sentence. And you can imagine that this C is changing from one sentence to another sentence, okay? This is how you're going to reduce the cost. And this is partial prediction. This is changing your loss. It is making it more efficient. But what have we achieved? First of all, we started with the full permutations. This is a generalization of the AR model, but then it was too much, too costly. We said we are going to reduce the cost, the cost of the computation, okay? still a generalization of AR to some extent, but then how is this generalizing the autoencoding language modeling? And this is where the beauty is gonna come in. The loss of the bird, you are assuming that if you know is a city and you were masking New and York, then New and York, given the context, were independent. That was the major assumption for BERT. What are you gonna do here? You first condition on is a city, it's going to give you new. And then given new and is a city, you can predict New York, actually York. So the only change is this new here. So you're conditioning on new and you're relaxing that independence assumption. And this is how you're generalizing BERT. So this model is generalizing BERT and it's generalizing uh, GPT type models. It is beautiful. 
And at the same time, in addition to this loss, you're going to have the transformer XL rather than transformer as your model. Okay, so you're going to have increased uh, context as well. I guess I'm going to stop here. For those of you who want to leave, you can leave. And for those of you who want to stay and ask questions, I'll be around. I had a question along the same lines of that. Like if T is, um, I don't know, 256 or whatever the, um, the normal size, 512, then there's 512 factorial possible permutations. So we don't, we don't actually sample over all of the permutations, but we just choose, I don't know, 100 random or 1,000 random permutations. Yes, that's right? correct. So you don't need to consider all of the permutations. Actually, a data a sentence goes in. In addition to that data that goes in, you sample a mask, you sample a permutation. It's going to give you your masks, and then you push it through your network. It's going to do its predictions, and then you're going to write down your loss function. That makes sense. And then you do that. You do that as many times as you want till your training loss goes down sufficiently, and then you're then you're happy. And and you usually have large corpus. You have the entire internet in front of you to do this. Per each sentence on the internet, you sample a couple of permutations and then you move on. Yeah. This is really I, beautiful. The way that you code this up, this is brilliant. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I had a question just about this last thing here with uh, how it's generalizing BERT. Mm -hmm. um, so are you saying that it's doing this in our like new loss function in this new model? It's like accomplishing this? Yes, this partial prediction loss is accomplishing that. So it's very similar to what you did for BERT. For BERT, you would uh, mask 15% of your words, okay? Here, you're masking 15% mm. of your sentence. Okay, and because it's not ordered, because it's like some random permutation, it's just like a random mask in your sentence. Exactly. Okay, okay. And Absolutely. the other thing is that you don't need to input the mask token anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just your permutation and these attentions. Mm -hmm that are gonna take care of that. Do you have uh, results for this? Like what, what kind of, um, uh, on like some downstream task? Yes, so whatever that I'm presenting, they are pushing the state of the art in terms of the perplexity and the downstream tasks. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely better than uh, Transformer XL and Transformer XL was better than BERT, etc. The actual numbers, there are very good tables in the paper. You can refer to that because this was the hard part of explaining this. I'm sure if you read this paper on your own, you're gonna get lost. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is a tough paper. Is something like a GPT-3 using methods like this or are they still sort of- No, GPT-3, the they are using very simple models. And the reason is that they have other challenges. Mm -hmm. Like the size of their data is crazy. The, they have billions of parameters and so they have a lot of engineering problems to deal with. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so they are going to stick to a simple model, but then scale it. Okay, just make it really big. Yes. Okay. This is a complicated model. Actually, not that complicated. It is also doable, but they didn't want to do it. Yeah, but maybe someone will look at scaling this sort of model up super big. Yes. Okay, that's cool. Sure. Any other questions? And the, the reason this... I'm, I'm... So look at this top right box where you have the loss for BERT and XLNet. The, the only difference here is that when, when you're predicting the top layer from BERT, you're doing it all in parallel. So you're only given one context and predicting every single output in parallel. And here, it's still this sequential autoregressive prediction. Exactly. So it is sequential, but the sequence is in random order. Yes. Maybe you're first predicting York in your next iteration. And then here you're conditioning on your and predicting new, okay? So it's doing kind of a little bit of both of the ideas. It's got the sequential properties from the autoregressive and it's got the masking from, from BERT. Yes, it's beautiful. And you can actually use, rather than using the encoder, you can actually use the decoder and get away with it because of this reordering, the masking. Okay, cool. Yep. Thank you very much. Sure.